in some ways, uh, we in ISKCON, it seems almost like we have a very narrow understanding of the Gaudiya tradition. So could you may take, may take a step back and we can discuss about how the Gaudiya tradition is existing in currently in Orissa? In, are do people, are there practitioners or there's the, in general cultural awareness is there? Are there people who are uh, uh, scholars who are researching? And maybe then we can go back toward the history, how it continued after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If that's the direction you are comfortable okay. taking. Sure, sure. We, we can just meander around a little bit. First of all, I, I can only speak in a natural way from my perspective. And I, Mu Oriya Baisi Buji Parina, I only understand very little Oriya language. I can read a few letters a little bit. And here I am <laughs> working as a research center. How is that? What inspiration do I have? I'm coming from an ISKCON perspective, but I have a, a, a perspective about Gaudiya culture, which Odia, Odia Gaudiya culture, which I find a lot of local people find interesting and fascinating because it's from a different perspective, from a different view. And that oh. began with my Guru Marsh. This is my Guru Marsh here, Prabhupada's disciple, Gorgavinda Maharaj. It's an old picture. You can, this picture says a lot, I think. Amazing. He came I from. Yeah, he, he came from Jagat Singhpur. He came from a very traditional Odia culture, Kirtan culture, in a small village known as Gadaigiri. And uh, I had good fortune to hear some from him. And that was kind of an unusual thing, especially for Westerners. But there's some Indian devotees who get some opportunity like that. But uh, for Western devotees, it's, it's a very unusual thing for them to get some opportunity to associate with, with, with traditional persons in other cultures. So my grandma's greatly inspired me. Uh, probably, I, I would have to say, I, I can show you a beautiful picture that I like. This is a picture someone took of the two of us together. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, probably the greatest gift my grandmas gave me, you can kind of maybe see in this picture here, this photo, is to think. And to think in a certain way, and to look in a certain direction, and to ask questions. Probably that's the, the greatest uh, gift that he gave me. And he did that through that audio culture. And I wish I could say that, that every class that he spoke, that I remembered every single <laughs> verse that he quoted and every song that he sang and every single story. But it's not like that. It's not like that for anyone. I have imbibed a certain amount of things and uh, a big inspiration came from him. And so now you, you have some people, myself included and a few others, who are becoming, by his influence, becoming interested in this Odia culture through Srila Prabhupada's window. Our, our Guru Maharaj was a disciple, Srila Prabhupada. I can show you a couple of rare photos that I got from the Bhaktivedanta archives. This is in Mayapur in 1974. And you see Srila Prabhupada walking. I don't remember the name of this Grihasa devotee. And this is Bhavananda Prabhu on the right, the sannyasi at that time. And there on the left, this very skinny devotee in brahmachari dress that's our burmash gorgavinda marsh oh, and uh, okay. so he was a little different in iskan because he already came from a vaishnav culture he already had some some culture that he brought with him and when he would speak he would give classes for sometimes three or four hours at a time and he would sing and he was fluent in bengali and odia and sanskrit and also english and he would quote from so many different things. And he had a particular style, which was very different. And Prabhupada encouraged him in that. So he was a great inspiration for that. He wanted us for Prabhupada's centennial to start a university for oh. Srila Prabhupada. And it's a long, complicated thing. Like many different projects, it ended up not working out. But Gora, as uh, we could discuss perhaps further, we have some idea to try to do something like that in terms of a university and things too. Oh, okay. So in one sense, you are saying that your connection with the whole uh, Gaudiya and Odia culture 
has come primarily through the inspiration and association of your Guru Maharaj. Yes, and also one other personality. Since is it, you like the pictures I'm showing, is this okay? Yes, <laughs> yes, of course. I'll I'll show you another picture. This is uh, my Guru Maharaj on the left, and this uh, gentleman on the right who's wearing white. This is Professor Fakir Mohan Das. Interesting Vaishnav name, <laughs> Fakir Mohan. And it's a long story. I wrote something for Satya Raja Scholarly Journal about him. Fakir Mohan Prabhu, I met him a little before my Guru Maharaj left this world. And he's been a very great inspiration for us. I attended classes from him for over 10 years. And uh, he was uh, flattering us, uh, praising us, chastising us. And whatever way he could to uh, encourage us to serve our guru and, and to serve Srila Prabhupada. But at the same time, he was also very, very conversant in Odia culture. And this is another picture of him here, a very effulgent personality. He's a research scholar. He's a PhD uh, from Utkal University. And uh, I, let me see here. I think I could tell you his complete. Uh, his complete academic and devotional title was Vaishnava Pravara Fakir Mohandas, MA, PhD, Doc D. Lit, Sahitya Charya, Vyakarna Shastri. <laughs> That's his complete <laughs> academic and devotional title. <laughs> yeah, he's quite a, a scholar. He, he uh, knew my grandmas at a young age, and at, at the age of nine, he ran away from home because he wanted to be a sadhu. The family life is Maya, and he, he grew up chanting Hare Krishna and reading this books of Bhaktivinoda talk where his favorite book was Hari Nam Chintamani and worshiping Jagannath. And he decided family life is Maya, my parents are Maya, and I want to be a sadhu. And so he ran away from home at nine years old, and his parents captured him a few villages away and brought him back. And then he managed, they managed to keep him for some time. And then at the age of 12, again, he ran away from home. And that time he came to Puri to, at, the, at that time, the only existing Gaudiya Mutt, which was the Purushota Mutt, which is right near Tota Gopinath. That's the only temple directly established by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And as a young boy, he moved in there. And it's a very long story. But uh, at one point, the authorities there in the temple, they saw that he was a bright young man, and they said, you should go back to school. And he said, I don't want to go to school. I came here to do Vaishnav Seva and to do Bhajan. No, no, you should go to school. And then they found out that he was a very bright student. So his guru finally instructed him that you should get a PhD in Sanskrit, and you should teach Gaudiya, Odia culture in the university as a kind of way of preaching. And so he did like that. And his whole life was a kind of a cross between academia and devotional life. The, the, his students called him the, the, the Babaji. <laughs> and he, uh, okay. he, he had, I don't know, probably uh, maybe a hundred or more people get their PhDs under him. He was probably the foremost authority on Gaudiya, Odia literature in Orissa. And he wrote a number of books and published many, many books. So he's, he wanted to start a research institute. In fact, my girl his idea for the university was going to be with Fakir Mohan Prabhu. He brought Fakir Mohan Prabhu to meet Srila Prabhupada when Prabhupada came to Bhubanishwar in 1977. And Fakir Mohan Prabhu was a very, very simple, humble person, was very inspired by Prabhupada. And so then later, after my Gurmaj left, Fakir Mohan Prabhu came and, and was helping us and, and preaching to us and giving us classes and nourishing us. And he wanted to open a research institute. And somehow he wanted me to help him with that, even though I'm not an academic, but I like books, as you remarked. And uh, we had a lot of discussions about that. And then he left this world a few years ago. And I've been meditating on this ever since, that, that we should do this research institute. So these are two big inspirations for us, mm -hmm. these two personalities in our life. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, mean, I have read about Fakir Mahantra, but I didn't know uh, specific details that he had run away, had gone run away at the age of nine. I knew he was a great scholar, but it's an inspiring story. So the idea of, say, devotees going back to academia, it's not just in ISKCON. There are precedents in the Gaudiya tradition before that also. 
That's yes. And, so, and, and although Srila Prabhupada said so much about how you know schools are, are what we call them slaughterhouses and like that, and that's a fact. Prabhupada wasn't mincing words; he wasn't flattering that they, they are a slaughterhouse. But at the same time, they also have some benefit. And Prabhupada told uh, uh, different devotees that to stay in the university and to use their their PhD, like Bhakti Shubh Damanar Maharaj and, and others, to to preach. And in fact, at one point, I think Garuda mentions this, maybe he spoke about this in one of your podcasts also, but he mentioned how Srila Prabhupada at one time wanted every temple to be connected with an, a, an institution, a, a, a university, and every temple should be able to offer master's degree and, and, and PhDs. He wanted every temple to do that. And that desire of Srila Prabhupada as far as I know, there's not one single temple in the whole world that's done that. But Prabhupada wanted every major temple to do that. 